Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about Second Life and uh, teaching chemistry. So what I'd like to do first is step back a little bit. You know, we've been talking about using a lot of different technologies, and sometimes we have to remember what we're trying to achieve with these technologies, right? That lets us know whether or not we're wasting our time. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over, you know, what is the role of a chemistry teacher? And I think that as technology changes, we have to remember that we ha still have to make chemists. That's our job ultimately, right? And what does this mean? Well, for me, it means that uh, we're trying to create individuals who are chemically literate at the undergraduate level and competent to create new useful chemical knowledge at the graduate level. So any tools that enable us to do that, we should use. Any tools that we're currently using that are no longer effective, we shouldn't use. So what does this mean in terms of actual activities from the teacher? So how do we actually uh, teach? We have to do three things. First, we have to select and deliver content. Then we have to assess and validate the skills and knowledge of the students to know if they learned it or not. And third, we can help catalyze the learning process. And this is the third one here that I basically put Second Life into. This is the stuff that you can only do if you have t enough time to do it. And so I need to explain how the rest of my course operates to show you how it is possible for me to spend time on this. So very quickly, uh, I'm not going to talk at all or very, very minimally about blogs or wikis and things like that here. But I just want to give you an idea of the evolution of my course over the past uh, several years. I teach undergraduate organic chemistry. And I started off with, of course, face-to-face -face lectures using paper handouts, then graduated to, you know, using uh, optional screencasts of lectures, which I'm recording this as a screencast. Then I went to audio podcasting, video podcasting. I started using blogs, wikis, uh, Google, uh, Google Video, YouTube, Google Co-op, and finally now, I'm really not even using podcasting in my class because everything's already archived, so it turns out it's far easier just to give the student a zip file and just have them unpack it, okay, because I'm not currently recording lectures. Let me show you why I'm not currently recording my, my, my lectures. This is what a screencast looks like, um, if you're curious. There's several different formats. You can have Flash. Uh, this happens to be the M4V format or MP4 on uh, iTunes. And the students basically just click this and they can expand the screen and they click on play and they can hear me explain the chemistry. So it's very, very similar to being in class and watching me doing what I'm doing here, right? Just presenting. So what happened is I actually plotted the attendance uh, of my class over time and observed that in all my classes, the attendance by the end was between 10 to 20%. So what I then did is I looked at the performance of the students who were still coming to class versus the students who were getting the class material exclusively through screencasts, and it was identical. So that's, the, you know, one of the things that I've stopped doing then is actually lecturing. So now instead I just assign the recorded lectures and I do other things with the time, which I'll get into in a second here. Okay, so while all this is going on in terms of content delivery, I'm also changing the way that I'm assessing students. So obviously I start with manual grading, then moved on to using WebCT quizzes, uh, voluntary, and then making the, the, the exams and the tests all mandatory on WebCT. Then I moved on to doing uh, extra credit assignments using blogs and wikis, quizzes on first person shooter games like Unreal Tournament, <laughs> quizzes in Second Life, and finally students assignments in Second Life. So I will obviously focus on the last two, but I'll show you a little bit of what these things look like on the way. Okay, so this third part that I was talking about earlier, this learning catalysis, uh, what does that mean? Well, essentially, by default, it's sort of your office hours and, and, and email, right, and, and the time that you're not in class. Because I now assign my recorded lectures, I have time to do things like uh, be present while students do problems, while they watch lectures, while they play games, while they, while they use Second Life. We can talk about the extra credit assignment. I can spend more time on that. I can address technical issues, very, very important. Um, where they bring their laptop to me and I can actually, you know, see what the problem is. You don't want a situation where you're assigning archived lectures and the student has some kind of technical glitch and they can't do it. All right, that would be uh, a nightmare. So this is what I end up spending my time doing in my workshops. Okay, so student assignments. So starting with, with blogging. I don't do blogging anymore, but that's how I started. Um, basically, I just had them, you know, pick something relevant to the class and blog about it. All right, so this is a couple of years ago. I then moved on to using a wiki. I think it's a little bit more 
useful uh, because you know you can modify the text and you can see all, all the different versions. And what I do here is I basically have them uh, do an assignment based on my research wiki, which we, we're, we are making anti-malarial compounds. And so they can actually see our lab notebook and they have to make some kind of comments on that in their projects. Okay, so, and we're using uh, JCAMP formats for the NMRs, so using JSpec view to, to view the NMRs and everything. I obviously don't have time to get into full details about this, but if you ask me, you know, can, can wikis be used for education, I think yes, and I've got some pretty good examples, I think, of, you know, having students use them in assignments. So let's talk about games a little bit. Um, I've been using games for many years, even before WebCT and everything. This is a game that I played a long time ago called Wheel of Orgo, where I start with a starting material and I put a, a final product, and then students take turns trying to come up with steps. So they have to put the reagents and they have to put the intermediate, and they get points for having that correct. The idea is to find, of course, a path from the beginning to the end. Okay, so that's an example of a game, something where it's the same material, it's just delivered in a, in a different, maybe more you know, entertaining format. So another kind of game uh, that I've used is Unreal Tournament. And if you're familiar with that, it's a first person shooter game. There actually is an educational version that doesn't have any weapons. And the way that this one works is you've got these doors and they're just images and they're either correct or they're incorrect. So if you walk through a correct door, you make it to the next set, to, to the next room. If you walk through an incorrect one, you have to start over, all right? so you know, you could do races like that. So there was no injuring or anything like that. Of course, on the full version with weapons, there's lots of blood going on, but we didn't use that one too, too much, but it certainly was available. Now, I would probably still be using Unreal Tournament if I hadn't come across Second Life. Uh, Second Life actually is a much better uh, infrastructure for doing this kind of thing. But here, instead of having rooms, uh, we basically have obelisks. So if you go on Second Life, and you're going to see lots of pictures here, so you'll get the idea. Uh, so this is me, by the way, and this is what I see as I'm moving through the, through the landscape. So what happens is students click on this obelisk, and the same four images pop up that I had in Unreal Tournament. And when they click on it, if it's correct, they get another set of four questions. If it's incorrect, they have to start over. So I can actually have many obelisks in a room, and I can have many students competing against each other. And that's what I refer to as my races, which I do a couple of times per term, and I give out prizes. So there's no grades here. It's basically just additional stuff that the students can do. Now, that's the stuff that I did. What about how my students are, or if my students are doing anything in Second Life? So I have had students do some extra credit work. And one of the things that we have the ability to do now is to actually create molecules starting from smiles or inches, and we just talk in Second Life using the chat box to these little resers that uh, are, are, are built to do that. And here's an example of camphor uh, showing a pretty complicated example of chirality, right? So these molecules are actually much bigger than the size of our avatars. And you can walk around the molecule, you can fly around it, you can see it in a way that's, that's completely different than you would in a small model, which you're limited to in, in, in real life. So that was a pretty good assignment. And we can have fun with it here. You can actually fly around on the camphor molecule and the students, you know, can, can engage in that, in, in that way. So this is actually on, nature, on Nature's Island called Second Nature. Uh, right now what we're doing is we're trying to work on uh, displaying spectra, especially NMR spectra in uh, Second Life. And I'm working with Andy Lang, and we've almost got it to the point where we can actually talk to the spectrum and have it expand. Again, we're using JCAMP format. Um, and if we can get it to work with JCAMP, we can get it to work for you know, NMR, IR, whatever, because a lot of the equipment uh, can be, can have spectrum in, in, in those formats. Other educational things that you can do, well, you can actually demonstrate docking. So here, this is actually the receptor site of enoil reductase, which is one of the malarial enzymes that we're trying to inhibit. And you just walk up to this molecule, you click it, and it slowly meanders down and fits right into the docking site. And you can walk around it, you can see you know, what's going on. It's actually a little bit hard to see where the hydrogen bonds are, but it's a good exercise nonetheless to, to, to try to see it. Now, if we put the entire enzyme here, we would run out of prims, which are the fundamental units. So we only put a, the, the pocket. But if you want to simplify the enzyme, you can actually create the entire enzyme, but you don't have every atom here, right? You're just showing it in a simplified uh, mode. Peter Miller has actually been very active 
with the constructions of proteins in Second Life. And you can go right from the PDB file to this 3D format. All right, so things are getting a lot easier for chemists in Second Life. There are more tools. And again, if you, if you can get the PDB or the Inchi or the Smiles, you're in really good shape now for actually just you know, doing these projects. Other things we can do. Well, we can actually see how uh, chemical reactions happen in 3D, right? So here's an example of an imine formation. I got an aldehyde, I have an amine, okay? So you can see the aldehyde here, the red oxygen. Here's the nitrogen amine. And you actually talk to the chemicals. So you come right up to them and you say next. And you'll see every intermediate pop up. So the next one here would be like this, where the nitrogen has moved over and now it's connected to this carbon and you have a carbonyl intermediate. And you can actually see the entire shift. And these are actually chemically realistic. So they've been minimized so that, you know, that's really what they probably do look like. And it, it looks very different than it does on a piece of paper, right, where everything's flat. So I think this is a pretty good exercise. Uh, and there's every step. So there's a couple of intermediates in that imine formation. And if you keep saying next, it'll keep going. Now, as we've been putting molecules on Second Life, we've been worried about how people are going to find them. And one of the things that I set up is a wiki, secondlifemolecules.wikispaces.com. And here we basically just put descriptors, we put the uses, and we put the slurls. The slurl is a link that when you click on it, will take you to Second Life to that specific location. So that's a way for Google to index it. We've got 3D periodic table. Again, working with Andy Lang for the ACS, we actually did this. You can have faculty offices. This is sort of what my office looks like on Drexel Island. You can put whatever you want there. Here's an example of my lab. So these are just pictures of my students. There's pictures of our chemicals. You have pictures of the equipment. There's all kinds of things that you can do to explain what you're doing. But the one thing that works extremely well in Second Life is posters. And you're going to see some of that uh, at the SIMIC session tonight if you come. And because you can do some really nice things, you can take your PowerPoint and you can just dump it into this viewer in, in Second Life. And when you click on it, it changes slides. So from the standpoint of a you know, learning curve, there's really not much to it. You just give your PowerPoint, boom, you're done, right? And we can put these little bells where when you click on it, it'll summon the presenter. So that's what we're going to do tonight at Symix. We're going to make sure that all the presenters have their little bells working. We've had conferences. Here's a, an example of a conference that I organized, the Saifu Lives On conference on Nature Island. And uh, you can see there's lots of people hanging around, talking to each other, and we're using the poster boards to give the presentations. This is ACS Island, if you're not familiar. Uh, it actually has the shape of the ACS logo. Uh, so this is the land and the water here gives it the outline. So if you see lots of moats and you fall in them, that's the reason. It's, it's to have this, this look. So just a few screenshots of ACS Island. Uh, here's the headquarters. And you can go inside here, get some freebies, get some lab coats, goggles, whatever. There's a, an ACS Landmarks. I wasn't familiar with the Landmarks before I started this project. But uh, you know, ACS has, you know, every year or every couple of years, they, they give these Landmarks like the, you know, the foundation of uh, chemical abstracts or the discovery of helium, things like that. So these are pretty neat. You can visit this, click on it. It'll take you to the website. And here's what the virtual poster area looks like. So tonight at 8, you can come around. So the posters look pretty familiar. And we've put some molecules here that represent most of the posters. So for example, the forensics lab talks about methamphetamine. So guess what? There's a molecule there to attract people to come over and look at it. <laughs> There's also uh, uh, nanotubes. And uh, Cass actually has a really interesting presentation. Hopefully, you'll be able to attend. This little molecule here I put is called phellocene. It actually looks like a cat. And we, we put in some eyes and some whiskers so you can see it here. But the ears are actually on the top. So again, very, very interesting what you can do in Second Life. Uh, ACS Island has a resident chemist program uh, where scientists can put up you know, some of their, their work. Henestroza's lab at Cornell is there. The Rosania lab, Gus Rosania from, from Michigan is there. And he basically puts up images from his uh, microscope. So he uses that to have meetings with his students and, and talk about scientific data. And there's also a geodesic dome. Uh, so when ACS does run parties, that's where it will happen. And that's a good place to meet. I don't know if anything tonight's going to happen there, but uh, you can check it out. And so basically, that's it. I mean, 
If you want to use um, wikis, it's a pretty good way to organize content and to interact with students. I didn't have time to go through that, but because of the versioning, you can actually tell students to do things on the wiki, and then when they correct it, they can remove your comment, but it's all in the versions, so that's a good way to interact. And you can use Second Life to stretch student and teacher imagination. So what I'm showing you is just what I thought was interesting and cool to do. There's many things we could do in chemistry, and if you have any ideas, just let me know, and I can you know, tell if it's realistic or not. And I guess the bottom line is really, we're not trying to replace one means by another. It's just additional channels. We're communicating the same basic chemistry. It's just to make it interesting and to get students engaged. That's really the, the point of it. And that's it. Thank you.